Welcome to the Pacific Research Institute's Next Round Podcast. I'm Marina Itchon, Senior Vice President, and on this podcast, our all-stars are back to talk about the results of the California elections. So with me now, virtually, of course, is, is Lance Azumi, PRI Senior Director of Education, Carrie Jackson, our fellow in California Studies, and of course, Tim Anaya, PRI Senior Director of Communications. So guys, let's, let's do the big picture first. Uh, let's get everyone's take from Tuesday night selection. And is there any one race or result that, that caught your eye as, as being an interesting development? So let me just start off. My big takeaway was just how lackluster the coverage was of the election. Outside of Sacramento, which of course is a government town, I was hard pressed to find good coverage on election night here in Southern Cal. I saw that Fox 11 had special coverage, but I had to do some serious digging to, to find anything else. Whatever happened to the man on the street interviews or, or covering the candidates in the last get out of the vote efforts or or even where, where is the drama of an election? You know, the thrill of victory and, and the agony of defeat. Newsom took his election for granted that he didn't even bother to, to have an election eve party. Um, I saw a headline. The headline was, quote, it is actually really election day. I think the media's blase coverage of candidates and issues in large part is why we have a low voter turnout. Um, in many counties, I read that as low as 14 to, to 16 percent of voters came out or, or voted despite ballots uh, being mailed to households. Um, so, so, you know, when the electorate is uninformed, you end up with office holders like Chesa Boudin, who San Franciscans ultimately recalled last night or recalled on Tuesday. If San Franciscans really understood his approach to public safety in the first place, they could have certainly made more informed decisions. I think it, and I think really it's largely due to the poor coverage by local media that Californians are kind of blasé about, about voting. As far as the race that I was watching closely, I was really wondering how well Michael Schellenberger would uh, fare in the, in the gubernatorial race. We knew he wasn't likely going to make the top two, but he just got over 3% of the vote last time I checked. A rather poor showing, unfortunately. We had Michael Schellenberger speak at a PRI luncheon in San Francisco to talk about his book, San Francisco. I thought he was a powerful speaker and offered some real thoughtful reforms on homelessness. So I hope he doesn't stop reaching out to the public with, with the end of this uh, gubernatorial run. What's your big picture takeaway, Lance? Well, you know, I think you're right, Ro, that, uh, you know, it was overall kind of a lackluster, um, you know, a coverage of the election. So the election itself didn't generate a lot of general interest. Uh, you know, people weren't talking about the governor's race. They weren't talking about, you know, any of the you know, various challengers that to Newsom, even though they, obviously there are problems here. Newsom, of course, likes to paint this rosy picture of everything California. Uh, but, uh, you know, obviously we all know that there's huge issues when it comes to crime and homelessness, uh, high prices across the board here in California, anywhere from uh, uh, housing to gas prices to you know, the, the uh, price you're paying in the grocery stores. So all of those things are present in California in the, you know, exponentially, you know, in many cases, more so than in other states. I mean, you just look at the gas prices here uh, versus other states. And while other states may be complaining, uh, the prices here are just absolutely off the chart, charts, you know, in astronomical ranges. And so yet that didn't seem to light a fire under a lot of people to try and like, you know, maybe change leadership uh, and to uh, go in a different direction. So I agree with you, Ro, that there was uh, that this general kind of lackluster uh, feeling to this election. But I will say this is that I think that in pockets, there was a lot of interest. And, um, you know, the, uh, certainly the race in San Francisco uh, with Chesa Bourdain and the uh, district attorneys recall race there. I think certainly generated interest there. I do think that uh, you look at other races around the uh, country. I think that there was was interest. And one of the races that uh, I was looking at specifically was down in Orange County. In you know my area in education, I was specifically was looking at some key school board races. And to me, one of the key uh, sets of races in the state was being held for the Orange County Board of Education. 
And you had a really interesting scenario down there. You had uh, three, the uh, conservatives on the Board of Education hold a four to one majority. And uh, so you had three of their uh, members, who uh, conservatives, who were on the majority, who were up for re-election. Uh, but you, you had this uh, other factor thrown in uh, there with, is that, uh, and this has to do with uh, the you know, ge general issue of redistricting that is an issue in many places, not just here in California, but around the country. Uh, in Orange County in particular, though, with regard to these school board races, you had this uh, interesting development earlier this year where uh, the uh, county boards of education usually are the ones who draw their own maps of their district lines. Uh, however, there is this very obscure body, which is a state created county commission basically, that is supposed to approve these county school board lines. And uh, usually they just you know approve whatever the county boards put in front of them. But this particular uh, county commission down in Orange County actually decided to scrap the lines that the Orange County Board of Education put before them and issue their own lines. That it was, and it was very unclear as to how they decided to issue these lines based upon what demographics, uh, except that they said that they didn't like the lines that the um, Orange County Board of Education put before them because they said it was somehow too weighted to white voters, you know, which is, uh, uh, you know, odd because if you look at the lines that the county commission put forward and which actually ended up being the lines that, you know, the candidates had to run in, that uh, those lines were actually very anti-Asian. And if you look at the uh, Asian vote in, uh, in Orange County, which is significant, it was split up into uh, various of these districts and in fact, Little Saigon, which is a hub of the Asian community there in Orange County, was very much split up. And uh, in, you, in fact, only in two of the five districts did you have Asian representation in terms of population and voters being equal to the level of voters, uh, Asian voters throughout the county. So uh, it was very much an anti-Asian uh, district lines, and it caused uh, actually a lot of consternation within the Asian community. So I think what happened then was that you had a lot of uh, this dissatisfaction with the um, uh, these new county school board lines, plus the fact that these uh, 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 county conservative county school board members um, were arguing against those lines, and it all came together to have a landslide for the conservatives in uh, these school board races down in Orange County. So uh, Mary Barkey, the president of the Orange County Board of Education won in a landslide. Uh, the, her two fellow conservatives also won pretty handily down there. And so, you know, you continue to have a strong conservative majority on the Orange County Board of Education, which is very important because they have been one of the leading um, uh, boards in California that has tackled some of these really tough issues such as critical race theory uh, and the COVID crisis. And so, you know, I, I look forward to what they're going to be doing uh, with their continued majority uh, in this coming term. And Kerry, what was catching your attention? Well, coming in, the media was really hot on how much of an earthquake. And I probably, using earthquake to describe anything in California, I think sometimes it's a little bit, a little bit uh, silly or maybe even, I don't say dangerous, but probably shouldn't do that, but uh, how much change we're going to get out of the California primaries. And um, I was skeptical of that. I said, yeah, I don't see anything really big coming. And, and I, I think that turned out to be the case. I, I will say congressional races, I surprised a little bit that Katie Porter, 47th district, ended up with 51% of the vote. I thought she was more vulnerable with that. At the same time, we kept hearing, or I, what I had seen, that Mike Garcia in the 27th district was vulnerable, but he ended up with almost 50% of the vote. So yeah, those are some small surprises. Uh, and what is not a surprise, I was looking at, and I, since I've covered this situation or this uh, this issue over time, is the recall that, as Lance mentioned, of the, and, and, and Roe of Chase Bodine as district attorney in San Francisco. Not surprised that he was recalled. I think everybody going in, except maybe he and his 
inner core uh, knew it was going to happen. What surprised me a bit, not shocked me, but surprised me a bit was how much, how hard, how hostile the voters were, 60 to 40 to get rid of him. Uh, I would have thought it had been closer to that. So that's a three to two. And I, I, you know, that surprised me a bit. Uh, And I also looked at the turnout in San Francisco, 26%. The state was about 19%. San Francisco had the highest turnout in the state. So I think they really wanted to get rid of this guy. Um, and I, I, you, know, you wonder what's going to happen with Gascon, uh, George Gascon, who was, of course, DA in San Francisco before he decided he was going to come to L.A. and be district attorney run. And when that, you know, how that sets him up for the campaign to recall him. And. I'm not sure, I'm not convinced yet that that's going to mean he's going to be recalled. And I, I kind of look at the, the how compact San Francisco is. And I think the, the residents in, say, Pacific Heights or people who work in the financial district are, are going to feel like they're a little more touched by the crime that we've seen, especially those videos that we've seen of what's happening around Union Square, as opposed to, say, in Los Angeles, where the West Siders who you know, they're not going to feel as affected by crime as happening, say, in downtown or far, you know, farther east of where they live. They, you know, L.A. Spread out, spread out and sprawling. So I don't think they're going to be touched in the same way that they feel it in San Francisco. Um, well, I should have said the Bay Area had the largest turnout in the state, not necessarily San Francisco. I want to back up that for a minute. Uh, I, I don't think that... Boudin being kicked out right now is going to make a big change in criminal justice in the state and even in San Francisco. Uh, they're not going to, the mayor, Leonard Brady, is not going to appoint as prosecutor somebody who's going to be hard law and order, uh, somebody that uh, the Republicans or the conservatives might get behind. That's just not going to happen there. So there will be some changes, but I don't see it being as, as big as some people think it's going to be. And I don't see how yet, I think we still need some time to especially see how things are turned out with Gascon in LA County about how this affects things in the state going along as well. You know, San Francisco, as I said, is compact. uh, And what's happened there, I don't know, is going to be reflective across the state. So that's, again, I'll go back. I was not surprised by the outcome but little surprised by what it looked like hostility toward Boudin among the San Franciscans. And, and I, I've written about this uh, even today, and it, you know, they, they turned out essentially one of their own and turned him out very hard. So my big takeaway was, as we've discussed a little bit, this lack of turnout. Now, as Carrie just mentioned, you know, as of this podcast taping on Wednesday afternoon, Turnout's about 19% statewide, and that final number will increase somewhat as ballots continue to be received and and counted. Remember, you have um, up to a week for your ballot to be received as long as it was postmarked on by Tuesday. And so when all is said and done, you know, we may see a number that will go up toward 30%, but we may end up having record low turnout for a primary election. So why are Californians not voting? And I think some of the reason, of course, is a lack of a competitive marquee race to drive up turnout. You know, I know legislators will be sad to hear this, but a hot primary for the state assembly is not going to drive people to the polls. Um, But I would argue that Californians are sending another message by not voting. You know, I would argue they're fed up with elected officials at the state and the local level who seem to be completely out of touch with what's going on. You know, we're paying over $6 per gallon for gas, yet you see California fighting amongst themselves about what relief Californians will receive and, and, and who will get it. And meanwhile, you see millions suffering with runaway inflation and higher costs of living and shortages of baby formula and the threats of power blackouts this summer and, and, and rampant crime and homelessness. And yet elected officials seem to be more interested in scoring points uh, for political purposes than solving problems. So I take yesterday's non-vote really as kind of a statement that 
people are tired of politics as usual, and they don't see any or many at all politicians on the landscapes who are doing much of anything to help them out and solve the problems that their families and communities are facing. Does anybody think that what's been happening in Washington for the last 15 months had any effect on what happened out here yesterday? And I, and I mean the Biden administration, everything is going. You mentioned fuel prices and energy prices and crime. Uh, so, I, I, you know, I, I've wondered about that, but I have not concluded in my own mind that it's had any effect in blue California, but it quite possibly could have. I think 100 percent. Absolutely. I think it's all it's all one and the same. People don't distinguish between Sacramento doing nothing and Washington doing nothing or doing bad things. I, I think it's an across the board statement on politicians who are focused on everything else but what matters to their real life. I won't argue with that. So one other interesting result for me um, was the race for California Attorney General. And we've talked about the Chase of Boudin recall, but you know, you saw Anne-Marie Schubert, who ran as an effective prosecutor who garnered national headlines for her successes in high-profile cases. But yet in a year when crime is obviously toward the top of the agenda, and the polls bear that out, you would think she would be primed for success. But the real in, uh, interesting thing here is Anne-Marie is not a Democrat or a Republican. She's a no-party preference voter. And unfortunately, you know, she came in fourth behind the two Republican candidates. And I think her results show that once again, even though you might actually be the right candidate speaking to the issues that a large swath of voters are, are, are concerned about, and you have a message that would appeal to Republicans and independents and disaffected Democrats, the instinct of voters in California, especially in these big statewide races, is still just to pull a lever for the candidate of their party. And it's really incredibly difficult to, even when you have a very appealing candidate like Anne Marie, get Californians of either party to really think outside the box in a primary election and ultimately cast that ballot uh, for the independent candidate. So let's look at some of the other um, key races around the state. Uh, we had a very interesting mayor's race in Los Angeles and Roe, I know you have been following that one closely. So what happened and what, what are your thoughts on uh, what the voters had to say? Well, it's very interesting, Tim. The top two vote getters um, who will be on the ballot in November, one is Karen Bass, a Democrat who represents uh, parts of Los Angeles, Century City, West LA, and developer Rick Caruso, who recently became a Democrat after being a Republican. Bass got, latest read is Bass got 37% of the vote, while Caruso won 42%. So this is going to be a real horse race. Caruso ran on, on a law and order campaign uh, with effective ads, which really resonated with Angelinos. As everyone knows, a crime situation in LA has been on the rise. There's a big recall effort with uh, LA District Attorney George Gascon. Caruso is also really focused on, on the homeless and the housing situation in, in Los Angeles. Karen Bass is to the Democrat establishment candidate. She's also getting a lot of support from the Hollywood celebrity types. Uh, and, and listeners might remember that she was on the short list for President Biden's VP pick. So he probably wished he had, he had picked her instead. As I said, I think this is going to be a real horse race. If there's going to be a big GOP route in November, as many are predicting, Caruso could very well be uh, uh, one of the candidates who uh, could be swept in, especially if the rising crime in Los Angeles continues to make headlines and, and you'll see quality of life and economic issues don't improve here in, here in Southern California, like, like rising gas prices. Um, it's over $7 a gallon in, in some gas stations here in LA. So uh, yeah, I, I, it's a very interesting race and, and we look forward to it. It's, it's going to be a kind of a refreshing you know, election for us here in, in LA. 
So Lance, you've been following the school board races. So how about talking about those? Yes, well, thanks, really. Uh, well, in addition to uh, those Orange County uh, board races that I've been following, I've been following some other important races in education. I mean, certainly the, the most um, visible would be the race for state superintendent of public instruction. And uh, the incumbent there, Tony Thurman, uh, who is finishing his first term, he had been a former state legislator and then ran for state superintendent and won uh, four years ago. Uh, was, is seeking a second term. And what's interesting is that despite the fact that uh, you know, he's a Democrat, he is the incumbent. And in a time where uh, in an election where you had Gavin Newsom, for example, you know, uh, winning a huge amount of the primary vote, uh, you actually had a real underperformance by Tony Thurman. Uh, last I looked, uh, he was polling significantly below uh, the 50% uh, level. Uh, I don't know whether when all the votes are counted, whether he will get to 50% or not. It doesn't, it doesn't look like it. And that, uh, you know, he will uh, be forced into a runoff. Uh, and so I think that's a, a really interesting uh, development that somebody like Thurman, who really should, uh, even just by party registration, uh, be way ahead, uh, you know, in, at the heights of uh, somebody like Gavin Newsom, because his uh, opponents were underfunded, uh, fairly invisible, that uh, he should run uh, such a underwhelming race with very underwhelming numbers. And I think part of that has to do with the fact that during the uh, COVID crisis, he really was kind of the invisible state superintendent. I mean, here you had uh, children who were being heavily and seriously affected by the COVID crisis, not just from the disease itself, but uh, shutdowns uh, and then masking rules and you know issues involving vaccines, learning loss issues, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, achievement that was going through the toilet right now, and yet here was uh, Tony Thurman, who really most people really didn't see at all during the crisis, and I think because of that, and because that people are generally unhappy with the state of public education in California, which is why I think you have a lot of uh, more competitive and interesting school board races around the state. I think that people took it out on Tony Thurman and um, you know, was, they were looking for uh, some alternative, even if they didn't know a lot about the alternatives. And right now you have uh, three different uh, candidates who are kind of vying to be the person who is going to be in the runoff against Thurmond. And uh, two of them are, I believe, uh, re Republicans and one, uh, I'm not sure, but uh, you know, you uh, have uh, Lance Christensen, who is a former uh, staffer to, I believe chief of staff to Senator, uh, State Senator John Morlock, uh, who also works for a uh, think tank here in California uh, and uh, looks at education issues. Uh, who's a you know uh, been a long time uh, acquaintance and friend of mine. Uh, he's he's running. He and uh, George Yang, who is also I believe a Republican, uh, is uh, uh, they they've both got about eleven percent of the vote, and as well as uh, a third person. Uh, I, I think Eileen Eileen Long is her name. Anyway, she, she they all with about eleven uh, uh, percent of the vote, and so. Uh, it will be interesting to see when the final count is tallied, you know, who is going to get uh, that, uh, you know, coveted second spot to run against somebody who may be more vulnerable than people thought. And so that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens in the general election. I also think that uh, you look around the state and I fully expect that when you uh, look at the final votes that you're going to see a lot more new school board members who are elected, many of whom are going to be probably parents uh, who are going to have run and uh, will end up being elected to these school boards because of the parent revolt that's going on across the country, but also too here in California, because people are upset with the direction of public schools on a whole host of issues, ranging from curriculum to uh, the response to COVID, to the lack of transparency uh, at, on school boards and at school districts. And I think that uh, you're going to see uh, a, a lot more parent activists who are going to end up on these school boards. 
and uh, probably change the direction of uh, these boards in the future. And uh, it'll be interesting to see and follow what, what happens in the coming uh, years. Um, and Carrie, uh, what do you think about uh, some of the issues that you've been following? I know that you've been following the uh, Chesa Boudin race plus others. Uh, I mean, any particular added insights on that? Yeah, I, I got a little bit to add, I think, to the, the, the Boudin recall. And uh, I, he was obviously wounded terribly by the videos that we saw of the shoplifters and also that raid at the Union Square, Neiman Marcus Square. I mean, it's the middle of the day. And, to, you know, it sort of gives a new meaning of the word brazen robbery or brazen, brazen crime. Uh, yeah, these videos went viral. And San Francisco, San Franciscans uh, are very proud people of their city. And I think that embarrassed them. I think that motivated them. To, you know, that they didn't want the world to see what they were seeing and didn't want the world to see them in a different, different way. I think they also grew weary of essentially being lab rats for a progressive sociological experiment that clearly wasn't going to uh, improve anything. So I think that had a factor in that, in, in them saying we we're just not going to, you know, we can't have any more of this fellow, so we're going to get rid of him. But as I briefly mentioned earlier, let's not fool ourselves and think that you know, the next prosecutor is going to be a real tough law and order fellow it's, or, or woman, you know, or female, whoever ends up in that seat. Uh, you know, there's, there's no more dirty, hairy justice in San Francisco. And uh, even, even Harry Callahan had a hard time in the 70s with his sort of primitive, rough, edge justice of getting that through 50 years or 45, 50 years ago in San Francisco. So we're not going to, we're not going to expect that. Uh, I, I, it will be interesting I, to see who ends up in that seat. So I took a look at the impact of redistricting on the various uh, congressional and legislative races. And, you know, keep in mind, this was the first um, election that was after the um, once in a decade redrawing of, of lines. And also um, you had a lot of retirements in the legislature, especially about a quarter of the new legislature is going to be new people. And so with redistricting, you saw some incumbents face the prospect of having a significant portion of their electorate be new voters. And that was the case with Congresswoman Young Kim in Orange County, who actually received a much more favorable uh, seat um, in redistricting than her prior seat. But over three quarters of the voters were new to her. And so late in the campaign, Democrats sensed an opportunity. And they actually launched ads to try and push her a primary opponent who was a, a past loser for a congressional seat and and really would have been an unelectable candidate in the general election. Uh, and they tried to push him into the top two. And so Kim and congressional Republicans were forced to spend over $2 million in the last week of the campaign in order to secure her victory. Um, looking at some of the other congressional races, you saw a new seat that was created in suburban Sacramento and Assemblyman Kevin Kiley and Democrat Kermit Jones went to the top two, and that will be uh, a lean Republican seat, but will be a competitive seat. Um, there's a new seat, open seat, in the uh, Central Valley where uh, Democrat Assemblyman Adam Gray and Republican farmer John Duarte were the top two vote getters, and that's going to be a very competitive general election. And, you know, in a little bit of a surprise, you saw in the Long Beach area, um, Mayor Robert Garcia looks like he's headed to Congress because he's unexpectedly going to face another Republican in the fall rather than Democratic Assemblywoman Christina Garcia, you know, who had a very poor showing on Tuesday night. And, you know, being a, a Democrat is uh, tantamount to being elected in that district. And the legislature, you saw a little bit of a different phenomenon. You saw a lot of cases where incumbents were thrown together in the same seat. Now, Democrats largely settled these disputes internally with retirements or, or, or moving, but Republicans chose to fight it out at the ballot box. So you, yesterday's vote set up some member versus member clashes for November. So you saw in a North San Diego seat, former Assembly Republican leader Marie Waldron is going to face off against our 
Assemblyman Randy Vopel in District 75. And it looks like um, you're going to see Republican Assemblyman Tom Lackey and Smitty Smith face off in District 34. Now, one of the oddest results happened in the Senate, where there was a primary in the Sierra Foothills for a new seat, Senate District 4. It's a very strong Republican district, and it's a very strong Trump district. But you had a perfect storm where you had two Democratic candidates almost evenly split the Republic or the Democratic vote. And then you had several Republican candidates uh, basically cannibalize one another so much that the top two vote getters are Democrats. So unless we see a change there as, as other votes come in, it's highly likely that Republicans are going to lose a sure thing one of the most top GOP state uh, seats in the state in November. Uh, but finally, you know, the race I was most interested in, of course, was the special election for Congressional District 22, which was vacated by the resignation of Congressman Devin Nunes. And I was so pleased to see my former boss, former Assembly Republican leader, Connie Conway, win election to Congress with nearly 60% of the vote. She'll be in Congress for about six months or whenever Nancy Pelosi allows her to be sworn in. So a question for everyone. Uh, what do you think Tuesday's results mean for the November election? You know, for me, I don't know if there were any real surprises in this election. I don't know if this election is, is particularly telling for um, November. But I, I would say that if, if we will have a strong GOP showing, uh, which is what pollsters are predicting, then we could see some moderate or even GOP wins here in the state, namely uh, Rick Caruso in uh, Los Angeles and, and Lanny Chen for the controller seat. And, and for those who would like to know more about um, Lanny Chen, we interviewed him in the podcast a few months ago. What about you, Carrie? I think it's almost too far in the future how things can turn quickly to make me kind of but you use the primaries to make any kind of prediction what's going to happen in November. We, you know, we don't know what's going to happen with economic slowdown. We might have a recession. Inflation looks like it's going nowhere. It looks like our energy prices, particularly gasoline, uh, motor fuels, I, you know, they look like they're probably going to be here to stay. They, uh, they'll go down, I'm sure, at the end of the summer driving season. But you know how much? You know, it, it's hard to say what just that's going to happen with this stuff. But again, we if we're sticking with California, we do live in a state where, as Tim mentioned, if so many of the voters just pull the lever for the party they identify with. And I, you know, that's something that hasn't seemed to change, hasn't changed much in the last two decades. And if I had to make any kind of forecast, I would say, or projection, I would say that I think things are going to be fairly status quo come November, at least in California. Lance? What do you think? Well, well Carrie, I, I, you know, I think that what uh, I'm interested in is, uh, you know, what, what exactly are going to be the big issues that people are going to be running on in November? I mean, certainly, uh, as we said earlier in this podcast, I mean, it was a bit blasé. You know, I mean, people weren't turned on by, you know, hardly anything in this election overall. And it'll be interesting to see if in order to, you know, uh, ignite greater voter interest, you know, what peop, uh, what the candidates are going to run on in the general election. I think that one of the things I, I, I was interested in, in looking at the results and what the candidates said after the results started to come in, uh, Michelle Steele, who is the congresswoman from down in Orange County, she's Korean American, uh, one of the first Korean Americans, along with Young Kim, also from Orange County, who uh, uh, Tim talked about uh, a little earlier, you know, both of them are represent uh, different parts of Orange County in Congress in the House of Representatives. And, you know, she will be uh, going up against Democrat Jay Chen in the uh, general election. And I thought it was very interesting to read her um, statement that she issued uh, for following the uh, primary results that uh, confirmed that she will be going on to the general. And out of the three or so uh, different issues that she mentioned, two of those were actually focused on education. And so one of the issues that uh, she uh, hit on is this uh, issue of the Confucius Institutes, 
So for people who have uh, read any of my work at Pacific Research Institute, you know that I have written uh, quite extensively over the years on these Confucius Institutes, which are basically communist Chinese front groups that have been established on college campuses and even in K-12 campuses uh, to push the line of the uh, Beijing government. And so uh, under the Trump administration, the Secretary Pompeo and others in the administration really fought against these uh, Confucius Institutes as being um, basically foreign agents operating on our campuses. And uh, universities and uh, schools started to cut back on them. Well, uh, what Michelle Steele did is she, you know, immediately charged uh, Jay Chen, the Democrat who's running against her, as being a proponent of these Confucius Institutes and not repudiating the Communist Party of China. And so it's very interesting that, uh, you know, this issue that, uh, you know, uh, about Communist China and the, their front groups in education will be probably a big issue in that very important congressional race in uh, Orange County. Also, too, uh, Michelle Steele focused on the, the issue of race preferences in college admissions and really hammered on uh, Chen saying that, uh, you know, we should not have uh, race-based um, preferences because they discriminate against, of course, a, a lot of people, but certainly against Asian Americans, and I, which I think is interesting that she, you know she decided to uh, focus on that as an issue because, uh, because Roe and I uh, we uh, wrote a chapter in a book called A Dubious Expediency that was put out uh, a little while ago. Uh, that, that our chapter focused on race preferences in higher education and how they hurt Asian Americans. And the fact that Michelle Steele is basically running on the issue that uh, Roe and I put out there, I think is very interesting that uh, you know she she's running on that and also thinks that that is a huge mover in her district. And I do think that um, it just also underscores how uh, race uh, these uh, um, race in education, whether it's in admissions or whether it's CRT, that that is going to be a, a huge continuing issue here in California. And um, you know, it's something that uh, I know, you know, I'll be addressing in my future work here at Pacific Research Institute. Uh, Tim, what do you think? So I like, since I followed the legislative and congressional races, I was interested in seeing what can you um, take away from Tuesday's results um, as we look ahead to November. So obviously the voter universe in June and November is gonna be quite different, but I think you can take away um, what the primary voters are telling us, uh, some clues about the strength of incumbents and the two parties in the key battleground races. So a good rule of thumb, of course, is that an incumbent or the votes of the candidate of one party combined really should exceed 50% in a primary election or else that's a sign that you're really in trouble for the November election. So if you look at these battleground races, you saw candidates like Congresswoman Young Kim significantly increase her chances of being uh, reelected as the Republican candidates in her district garnered more than 60% of the vote combined. But then you see like Republican Congressman Ken Calvert in District 41 in Riverside and Democratic Congressman Mike Levin in, in District 49 in, in, in San Diego, they probably now each face a tougher November than they anticipated because Democrats and Republicans nearly split the votes evenly in the primary election. Um, the same goes in the legislature. You saw Republican turned Democrat Assemblyman Brian Mainshine in District 76 in North San Diego, who you know, barely per, per surpassed 50% of the vote in a seat that most observers probably didn't have on their list of fall battlegrounds. So that seat probably is now one to watch in November. Um, and then for signs of, of incumbents who are, who are in trouble, there's another member versus member race in Orange County where a Democrat, Cotty Peachy Norris, had a very strong showing against a Republican Stephen Choi and she beat him by nearly double digits so far in, in, in the primary results. And I think that's a, a real sign that he's in real trouble of losing his seat this fall. 
Well, these all-star podcasts are always a lot of fun for us, and I hope our listeners really enjoy them too. And as is our tradition, we often tip our hat to John McLaughlin. So guys, on my count, three, two, one. Bye. 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 If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. And when you're on these platforms, don't forget to give us a big five stars. If you don't subscribe to any of these, you can still listen on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash Pacific Research One. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Ichon. Hope you'll come back again for next round with PRI.